Okay, enough stories for your evening. Let's talk about map scale. We did this a little bit the other night. Um, so when we're looking at map scale, um, we're looking at map distance over Earth distance. So one of the things that, um, that I was taught in grad school is that, and this is a, sort of a saying, is that cartography is the science of reduction, right? Because we never do anything at a one-to-one. -one. So cartography is all about both, actually, the art and the science of reduction. Because when you generalize, how do you make things look good, too? But GIS is somewhat the same in that we have to deal with reductions. And we must keep them in the same unit. So we never say one inch to one mile, because that's two different units, or one meter to one kilometer. It's like it has to be met meters on both sides or miles on both sides, right? Or excuse me, not miles, inches on both sides. And we always have to have a one that, to be able to do a comparison of how much of reduction have we done, how, how far away from the surface of the Earth have we gone. All right, and I mentioned this to you that GIS is actually scaleless because we can zoom infinitely into the map. We can keep zooming in and we can pull further and further out so that the actual one, there's not like a stable printed analog screen. It's, we can just keep going in until we can't zoom anymore, right? But the data itself is not. So when we look at a USGS 1 to 24,000 topo map, the data was collected for use at 1 to 24,000. If you zoom in more than at 1 to 24,000, you can't increase the accuracy. You can always decrease accuracy, but you can't increase it. All right? So the, the, the thing with scale is, is that not only do you have to have the same projections, the same reference properties, but you also have to have two maps of the same scale. Right, you don't want to take a map that's 1 to 24,000 and then, oh, hey, I got a contour map over on this side that's 1 to 100,000. Right? That the actual proportions, the relations of distance won't line up. Correct? But that's kind of the key with map scale. So think about map scale as we go through. And what we want to do um, for this lecture, and it'll continue on, is really the focus for me is on this graph. And I, at, and or a, a worse looking graph of this one later. We're going to work through the different ways that we can measure the shape and the size of the Earth. That's what geodesy is about. And measuring can allow for position and not so much for us because we, well, maybe unless you go into the military, you can you know, trajectory your smart bombs and Let's do something. Your scientific mission to Mars or some other place, you can get the motion and um, going correctly. And we can also configure and measure large areas on the surface of the Earth. So it's, it's literally how can we do planimetric measurements at high quality and, and generalize them for different purposes. Okay? So we're going to look at different shapes, not so much the Earth as it naturally is, but so our first sort of three-dimensional model will be a geoid. And then we're going to get more general as we move up. We're going to look at the ellipsoid next. And then on Thursday, we'll discuss the sphere and map projections. So we're going to mainly stick with these two right now. So you know your definition of a map projection, right? That it's, three, it's literally, if you're taking a three-dimensional object, and how do you represent it in, on a two-dimensional plane? But when people, that is often forgotten is that we're talking about the actual graticule, the latitude and longitude lines. It's the conversion of the global graticule from 3D to 2D. Because with that, you can think that you're having a structured grid, and then objects that sit on the grid, how do they transition between a, a three-dimensional and two-dimensional? You know the, the history of map projections that they used to, um, you know, be like the candle. You can see Mercator with his candle, and then they hold up part of a globe and it projects it on a wall. You know, the, the little shadow, and then they could go and draw it. And that's literally the idea of projection. Um, and actually, we could go back further. Uh, Ptolemy would be even had a two-point projection system. You can look at Ptolemy's original 
geography and look at early projection techniques, going back to the Greeks and before. So let's talk about the geoid. You see, I went back to old cartography textbooks. So with the geoid, we're modeling the shape of the Earth as um, using satellite measurements. Um, and literally, the definition is just a 3D irregular solid, if you want to think of that. Just a 3D irregular solid. So yes, it's, it's approximating bumps and bulges on the surface of the Earth, but it's not so much like, oh, this bump is Mount Everest, or this bulge is you know, what I had for lunch. Um, it's more how the gravitational pull makes the equator big. You know, the equator's bigger, but it has different kind of bulges on the Earth because of the gravitational field. It's our most accurate model of the shape of the Earth. And here's kind of a rendition of it from the USGS. But, and this is, so remember 3D irregular solid. It gives, it does work for precise surveying and defense purposes, but it's not used much at all in GIS. You'll rarely, if ever, need to use a geoid as your spherical model in GIS practitioners. So those are my two key points, 3D irregular solid, um, least likely model used in your GIS everyday world and life, all right? Unless you're doing work in the Grand Canyon, it might be good to have a geodesist around, or you know, those real deep canyons and uh, mountains.